Greetings and welcome back to Freshman English and the My Perspectives volume. We are now in the Unit 4, the Star-Crossed Romances Unit. Of course, Romeo and Juliet is going to be our focus of study. I'm with you on page 360 and following. If you back up just two pages, um, uh, you'll see the beginning of uh, this Unit 4, Star-Crossed Romances. And then the question, do we determine our own direction in life or in love? Uh, or are we simply at the mercy of fate? This will be questions of what we call determinism and, 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 and notions of fate. Uh, we'll get there. Hey, start on 358 with your unit goals and then the academic vocabulary for argument on 359. Now, we're going to look at the launch text here. Uh, a selection, uh, this selection, I'm just reading with you on 360. This selection is an example of an argumentative text, a type of writing in which an author states and defends a position on our topic. This is the type of writing you're going to develop in the performance-based assessment at the end of the unit. Now, as we read this together, look at the way that the writer builds a case. Mark the text to help you answer this question. What is the writer's position and what evidence supports it? Now, we've got eight brief paragraphs here. Let's just work through each uh, paragraph and do a little bit of quick annotating. The main characters of William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet have long inspired audiences' pity. You'll remember from our study at LearnStrong.net already that when we study Aristotle's poetics, we know that there's going to be two emotions that will be elicited from tra through tragedy for the audience, fear and then the other is pity, and we're talking pity here. For hundreds of years, people have watched as the two characters meet, fall in love, both brokenhearted take their last breaths. While the play's ending is tragic, the famous lovers' deaths are the result of their own impulsive decisions. Romeo and Juliet were not destined to die in each other's arms. That outcome was not inevitable. Instead, their own bad decisions brought them to that terrible point. The, when, when the play begins, the city of Verona is being battered by a rivalry between two important families, the House of Montague and the House of Capulet. Swordsmen, now we've got a little bit of summary here, right? Swordsmen from both families hurl insults at one another and fight in the streets. Now, if we haven't actually read this play, Romeo and Juliet, yet, um, then some of what we're reading is going to be a little maybe confusing because we don't know actually how the story goes. Of course, we've been working with some bullet pointing of some summary work and the like so that we have a sense that the play is going to be about this feud between these two families. That's the political component of the play. Romeo, the son of the head of the Montague, sneaks into the Capulet's party. Here he sees Juliet, daughter of Capulet, and the two fall head over heels in love. Even though their families would never accept their union, they were more than willing to throw everything away to be together, having known each other for barely an evening. This is what we call the impression of time, as we'll say in later lectures. Indeed, Juliet says as much of their love. She says, it is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning which that cease to be ere one can say it lightens. Paragraph 3. The sheer lack of care with which they pursue their romance is startling. Neither tries to find a way to reconcile their parents to the idea or even to flee the city. Instead, they hurriedly marry in secret, obviously with the help of Friar Lawrence as well as we'll get into that discussion. As the play continues, paragraph 4, the drama of poor judgment, I would circle that phrase, poor judgment, unfolds. Juliet's cousin Tybalt goads Romeo to fight. Unwilling to fight a relative of Juliet's, Romeo refuses. The situation deteriorates further, eventually leading to Romeo's killing of Tybalt. Again, now we're just summarizing the play. Throughout these events, Romeo simply reacts in the heat of the moment. Write that down, reacting in the heat of the moment. He's not guided by principle or clear thinking. The result is that he's forced to leave Verona in exile, a situation that sets up the final deadly outcome. Paragraph 5, Juliet is shocked, of course, when she hears of Romeo's exile. In another example of startling miscalculation, she chooses to fake her own death in order to escape to be with, with him, with Romeo, right? She does not even wait to make sure Romeo knows about her plan, right? It's, too, it's, it's pretty impulsive, isn't it? At this point, the play proceeds with a cruel irony that ends with Juliet and Romeo taking their own lives. That is to say, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their lives, the opening, the opening sonnet in the prologue of Act 1, right? Paragraph 6. This play features numerous references to the stars. I would circle that. It's huge. Which symbolize destiny or the absence of human choice and control. These references seem to support the idea that Romeo and Juliet never had any influence over the paths their lives would take. They were destined to meet and destined to die. Indeed, the prologue calls the two leads, as we just quoted, star-crossed lovers. 
meaning lovers doomed by the stars of destiny. Romeo suggests this much before he goes to the party where he meets for the first time Juliet. I fear, he says, too early, for my mind must give some consequence yet hanging in the stars. When Romeo hears of Juliet's death, he cries out against fate, then I defy you, stars, he will say. Yet she's not actually dead, nor is the situation controlled by the stars. Romeo does not know this, but the audience does. Juliet's death, quote unquote, right, is not a result of destiny, but of her own choices. Despite some instances of puerile fortune, most of the tragic events are the result of Romeo and Juliet's youthful decisions uh, and haste. Now, I would, I would circle that youthful decisions and haste because we're going to ask, the, the suggestion that it's youthful seems to suggest that as we get older, then we're more wise and we're more circumspect and we do things better. But of course, when we look at Juliet's father, Lord Capulet, he's going to treat Juliet really terribly. And we have to ask, and along with Juliet's mom, well, we have to ask, really? So are the adults in this play much better? I mean, think about Friar Lawrence as a classic example who decides to marry these two. To finish now, in short, Romeo and Juliet were not the victims of destiny. Instead, the two stumbled into their own tragedy. Rather than suffering inevitable doom, they made fatal mistakes. The stars may shine above the events of this play, but that is not the true reason for the tragic outcome. And again, that's a re re recapitulation of the thesis of this brief argumentative piece. That is to say, Romeo and Juliet die because of their own choices, not because of fate. Well, now, obviously, there's a counter-argument to this that's set up by Shakespeare himself right at the beginning of the play. Obviously, we're going to get into this debate. Hey, do the summarization on 362, and then make sure that you write on 363 with a quick write. We're very interested in this problem. Should the opinions of others affect our own choices or destinies? That is to say, should we go our own way, or should we listen to what other people have to say? Come back, we'll do some more introdu introduction work uh, uh, of Romeo and Juliet, and then we'll get into the actual study of the play. Thank you for joining me.